Matthew, the 21st chapter. If you have your Bible, lift it in the air. Just as a witness, I carry my word with me. Lift it high. I want to see it. Amen. Unashamedly. You got the word of the Lord. Matthew 21 and 10. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that had sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money chambers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called, what? The house of prayer. But you've made it a den of thieves. And the blind and lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. I want to preach this morning when Jesus walks in. When Jesus walks in. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lift your hands. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your presence that's here. Walk into this place in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, thank you for standing. Amen. There's a whole lot of shaking that's going on in our world. We have just come out of a pandemic, coronavirus. We understand 4,547,782 people worldwide have died from that virus. We didn't know two years ago that our world would be in such chaos didn't know that Russia was about to invade Ukraine. Didn't know that thousands of innocent boys and girls, men and women, soldiers, would die on the battlefield in our time. Didn't know all of evil's intentions. We didn't know about the plans and the thoughts that were happening even then. We don't know about North Korea. We know that they, they are flexing their muscles continuously. We don't know about Iran and their battle for a nuclear bomb. There are many uncertainties in our world. But I will tell you, when Jesus steps in, he speaks peace to the troubled waters. When Jesus steps in, everything, everything changes. And so here we are, Matthew 24 and 3, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us who, tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. Somebody say, I don't want to be deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you be not troubled, not troubled as they are. For all of these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And all of these are the beginning of sorrows. I want to go back to the 21st chapter in our text, verse 10. And when he was coming to the city, all the city was moved. The Bible said when, when Jesus came to Jerusalem, the whole city was moved. Somebody say I want to be moved by Jesus. Amen. That word, mo word moved in the English is moved. But in the Greek, it is size, where we get the word uh, seismograph or seismic. And so, and it's this idea of shaking when Jesus came into the city. Oh, I want to glorify him today. I want to lift him up today. I want to put him in his rightful place today. 
we in our minds become so preoccupied with this world that we forget about the magnitude of who God is. The Bible said the whole city shook at his ar arrival. <clears throat> Amen. And how many wants God to shake our city with revival? God, shake this place with revival. Shake this place to where our parking lot, we can't fit them. Where the building, we can't fit them. When we try to rent bigger places, we're struggling to find a place big enough to put them. What are you saying? I'm standing on the word of God today. God said the latter end will be greater than the former. He is going to shake this world. He's going to shake our city. Nothing that is happening in our world that God does not know about. God is all-knowing. He knows everything about the past. He knows everything about the present. And he knows everything about the future. Our God is omniscient. He is omniscient. He's omnipotent. There's no God like our God. God is that all-powerful God. He is not lacking in any area. He has every base covered. He never sleeps nor slumbers. The Bible said in the book of Psalms that God who keeps Israel will never slumber and sleep. He never gets overwhelmed. He is never strong-armed by any man. God never gets tired. He never met an enemy that he did not overcome. I say it again, God has all power. He has the power in this place today to heal your body. He has the power today to deliver you from whatever stronghold that holds you bound. He has the power today to save your soul from an eternal hell. He has the power to help you forgive. Amen. He has the power to forgive you. He is omnipotent. He is omnipresent. He's all, every place, every time. There's no place you can go where God isn't. David said, Psalms 139, if I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the grave, you are there. David said, if I take wings of the morning and fly away and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, your even your hands shall lead me. I promise you today that God is with you. I promise you today, according to the word, that he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You're not an island by yourself. You may be betrayed by a close friend. You may be on isolated from situations, but God said, I will never leave you. That's why Paul told us in the book of Colossians, all things consist by him and are sustained by him. The whole world is held together. Amen. Our world would have come apart at the seams a long time ago because men self-destruct. We self-destruct our own lives. We self-destruct our own families. We self-destruct our own bodies. But something about the grace of God and the mercy of God that has held us together. But who is that remnant? It's the people that are called by his name that have humbled themselves and prayed and sought his face. And the mercy of God is still on America. The mercy of God is still in this country. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's at all places, at all times. But beyond that omniscience, beyond that unlimited knowledge of God, beyond that omnipotence of God, beyond all of that power of his omnipresence that he is everywhere at all times we must understand that there's a dimension to the presence of God don't miss this and even though God is in all places at all times there is more of God that can be encountered in a place we live in a world that serves the God of this world godless people People that do not even believe in a God. Or if they do believe in a God, he's some false God. It's some God that doesn't even exist. Many just serve the God of the flesh. Second Corinthians 4 and 4, Satan, who is the God of this world, 
has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Oh, I wish I could talk to you today about what Satan has done to the minds of people and how he controls and manipulates people. They don't understand the message about the glory of God. They don't understand about this new birth message. Amen. And many times they don't believe in any God. But Romans 8 and 7, the mind governs by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. When we talk about the dimensions of God and the dimensions of God's presence, we're not talking about simply agreeing that God is everywhere at all times. I believe we have believed that if we're the children of God. We believe that God is everywhere at all times. But God is in this place 24 hours a day. You can come here all hours of the night or all hours of the day, and God is here. Amen. But how many can testify that when you come together in this place today and we begin to worship God, we begin to sing the songs of Zion, we begin to clap our hands, we begin to lift our voices, that something happened in this room. It's like God came into this room and sat down. It's like something came over you. Omnipresence is an acknowledgement that God is in all places at all times. Listen carefully. But there is a dimension to the presence of God to where you can actually walk into a building and know in your mind that God is there. You can walk into a place where there's a presence of God. Amen. That something happens when you walk into the room. You know that he is there. You walk into your prayer closet and he was waiting on you there. There is something about the presence of God. God announces to you, I am here. Does anybody feel God today? Would you witness that by lifting your hand? <laughs> the Bible teaches that God is everywhere at all times. Amen. But there are times when God shows up and you know it. There are times that God shows up and we show off. There are times that God shows up and he shows off. Amen. Have you ever walked into this place and chill bumps came up and down? Amen. Your, your hands, or you felt chills up and down your spine. You felt something. You know it's like electric. It's electrifying. It's powerful because you know, you know that God was in that place. Amen. 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 Goosebumps. Amen. It feels good to feel when he's in the room. There's nothing like, nothing like feeling his presence. There is nothing in this world. There is no high. There's no drug. There's no experience in the world like just knowing, oh, he enveloped me. I begin to dance before the Lord. I begin to shout before the Lord. I begin to weep before the Lord because I recognize that he was in the room. There are dimensions of God. It's important to understand that we embrace the omnipresence of God. We know that he is everywhere. We know that he is here. We know that, but this church will never be satisfied with just mental acknowledgement that God is in the room. Amen. We don't just want to know about him being in the room. We want to know he walked in the room, and he is already in the room, and I can feel him, and I know that he is about to do something miraculous in my life or in this church. Scriptures like where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Pastor, I thought he was already there. The Bible talks about he is omnipresent. Yes, he's always there. So why would Jesus say this? Why would he tell us this scripture? Amen. Why would he say to let us know why would he take time to let us know personally that he is there? But where two or three get together in my name, you know that I am there. 
I don't want to just sit in the building and know that he's out there somewhere. I want to know that he is here. I want to feel his presence. I want to feel the joy of the Lord that restores my soul. I want to clap my hands unto the Lord. I want to shout with joy. I want to dance before him. I want to know that he is here. Amen. I want you to be in a place where you can sense, he says, I want you to be in a place to where you can sense me walk into the room and your natural body may not understand it, your natural mind may not comprehend it, but there is a spirit man, amen, inside of everybody in this room that gets excited when Jesus comes into the room. There is something that happens on the inside. This body doesn't understand it. This flesh can't comprehend it. But, oh, if your Holy Ghost filled, if you've been buried in his name, oh, there's a witness of his power. There's a witness that he's here. I feel him. Oh, there's joy in my soul. The spirit man inside of you demands some reaction. It's that cold, lukewarm spirit. It's that fleshly body that's got the upper hand. It's the carnal mind that's got the upper hand. But I was glad, somebody said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It's not a mundane thing. It's not a, just a casual, oh, I get to be with the people of God. I get to worship with the people of God. I get to hear the word of the Lord. There are places in the Bible where God shows up with his manifest presence. Oh, I, I've preached to you about the fire, the Holy Ghost and fire. I've told you that if there was a fire in the building, no matter what your personality is, you would learn how to jump and run. You'd be out running people that never seen you even hardly lift your little finger to the Lord. I will tell you that today is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Chronicles, the Bible said that the priests of the temple came under such an auspice of the glory that they could not stand up in the power of God. He that hungers and thirsts after righteousness, he that hungers and thirsts after things of God. There's a glory of God that God wants to fill the house. A glory, he wants to cloud this place with his presence so strong that we can hardly stand in his presence. I want you to give God something to work with today. Lift your voice, clap your hands, lift your hands, and magnify him. fell down because they could not minister. It was so intense. The glory of God was so overwhelming. It was so powerful that they couldn't even stand in his presence. Anybody hunger, hungry, hungry today for a deluge of God's power? Anybody hungry today for an outpouring of the power and the spirit of the Lord? <laughs> oh, maybe you haven't seen it. But we've seen it here. There are times when people fall out, slain in the spirit. Now, if you're so stiff and you're so postured and, and you're so prideful, you'll struggle to get even one finger up. But there's somebody that says, oh, God, hey, man, I've got, I'm plugged into heaven's current. I'm plugged into God's power. And I'm sitting here on the precipices of revival in my family, revival in my soul. I'm sitting here on the edge of healing and deliverance. Uh, sometimes the presence of God comes in the building so strong. What are they doing? I'm dancing like David danced. I've got joy, unspeakable joy, and full of glory. Amen. Amen. Now, what about these kids? Are they just too young to know? They're out here running around. What is their problem? Maybe we ought to say, what's our problem? Hallelujah, because the glory of God 
comes down on us. Sometimes our legs give way to his goodness. Sometimes we begin to think what the Lord has done for me. You don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me. You don't know what he brought me from. You don't know how he brought me out of the miry clay. You don't know I was a drug addict. You don't know I was on my way to a devil's hell. But oh, when I get to thinking about the goodness of Jesus... When he walks in the room, we feel his presence. Amen. The excitement when some high government official, they roll out the red carpet. Security is there. Everybody knows the announcement is made. Head of state, here he comes. Electricity in the room. Oh, but it doesn't match this. When the king of kings and the Lord of lords has blessed us with walking into this place. How can I be nonchalant and casual and carnal and be thinking about what I'm going to cook or what I'm going to eat, amen, or what I'm going to post on Facebook or what I'm going to do? i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to command my mind to worship him because the greatest thing that ever happened to me is that he filled me with his spirit and he would give me favor to be in his presence. There is a place that the Spirit of God overtakes us when we yield to him. Amen. Does anybody want to go to a place to where you absolutely feel are in enveloped with the presence of God? We're living in a time where God is wanting us to go beyond just the knowledge of him to his presence of experiencing him. God is intensifying, he's zeroing in on nations and people because in the latter days, we talked about, we heard about wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and earthquakes and all of the things that are coming and all the things. But can I tell you, they're not just coming. If you have been asleep for the last 15 years, let me give you some news today. It is already happening. Bible prophecy is being fulfilled on a daily basis. Let us not go to sleep at the wheel, but understand where we are. He is intensifying his power. If you don't think he will commit and complete every word that he spoke, then you don't know God. Everything that is in this book will be fulfilled. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He keeps his promises, and it, it would do you well to plug into him now, to plug into his word, to yield yourself to him, and allow him to be God of your life. He's intensifying his presence, we're beginning to see, I believe, in the church, the spirit of the Lord intensifying where he will manifest his glory in ways that the flesh knows someone greater than us is in the building. He can do more in one thimbleful of time than we can do in 10 lifetimes. He can speak the word and it begins to happen. I will tell you, we have the ability to speak the word of God. He has given us the ability to boldly walk to his throne of grace and make our petitions known. There are places in the Bible where God arrives. Oh, he was already there. But where he arrives, where he shows up, goes beyond just the omnipresence of God, just the glory of God. There was this place over in Samuel where this, this happened because there was a man named David who was the king over a nation that was called Israel. He inherited the throne from a backslidden king named Saul. So here, Saul, who had became full of pride, Saul got exalted with pride. He was a rebellious man. He was a man who was hard-hearted toward the things of God. He got used to the things of God. This can never become 
just casual church. It can never become a casual relationship. It can't be something that I'll call you once a month, honey, and I'll just check on you. I'm still your husband. I'm still your wife. I just want to make sure you're all right. I'm all right. See you later. Bye. No, it's a relationship. It's a commitment. It's romance. It's intimacy. It's a relationship with him. He was a man, Saul, who became hard-hearted toward the things of God. He lost his fondness and affection toward God. God told him to do one thing, and Saul said, I'm going to do my own thing. The Bible said that Saul was king for years without the presence of God. Oh, I can't imagine living without his presence. In the middle of the night, wherever it is, at any time of the day or night, I can lift my voice to him and I can feel his presence. Do you know there are people, there are congregations all over the world that have gone on without him. The form of godliness, they have great entertainment, they have great singers, they have great musicians, and they have great orators, but oh, there's nothing like people that have heartfelt worship. It's nothing like having holy people, godly people, godly musicians, godly singers that will give praise from their heart to the king of all kings. He did not give heed to any kind of concern to the Ark of the Covenant. In the Old Testament is a type and the shadow and the representation of the glory of God. Saul is sitting on the throne, and miles down the road, the Ark of the Covenant is sitting at a house, and he doesn't even care that the nation is being run without the presence of God. So the Bible says that when God got rid of Saul, he went and found a king, a man after his own heart. There was a man named David. Everybody say David. David was not a prideful man. He was a man after God's own heart. He wasn't maybe the strongest man, and he was a lot of things he didn't have that you would think that he needed to be a king, but oh, whom God calls, God qualifies. But he was this. He was a, an obedient man. The Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen. He wasn't that David was perfect. David had a heart after God. If you prayed anything, God, I want a heart after you. I want your wisdom. I want to chase you, Lord. I want my heart to be toward you, Lord. Amen. What about you, David? Is there one thing that just stands out? Yes, David was a worshiper. I don't know what you came to do. It doesn't matter if my wife is laughing, David, mocking me, making fun of me. What a fool you are, David. David said, I can't stop it. He's been too good to me. I can't stop it. I know you don't understand. I know you're ridiculing me, but I can't stop it. I've just got to praise him. I'm going to praise him in the morning. I'm going to praise him in the noontime. I'm going to praise him every chance I get. Oh, clap your hands with all of your might. No, David didn't do everything perfect. No, no, he didn't. He made a mess of things at times. Amen. But you know what he didn't do? He didn't blame everybody else for his mess. He didn't start accusing everybody around. He didn't do that. In Psalm 51, David messed up. He said, against you, against you only have I sinned. He understood the gravity of sin. He understood that, oh, the most important thing is not that I got caught, but that I sinned before you, God. I want my heart pure before you, God. <laughs> Cleanse me, he said. Wash me with hyssop. And your word, he said, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Would you lift your hands and say, don't take your spirit from me, but cleanse me, Lord, from my iniquity. Amen. Wow. And if people handle their mess in different ways, they get upset, they run away, they turn 
They turn on God. They turn on people. They turn on the church. They turn because of their mess. But oh, all God says is what I want you to do is humble yourself before me and I'll restore you. And I'll take what the devil sent against you and what the devil meant for bad. I'm going to turn it into good. Just humble yourself before me. That's what the Lord says. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Take whatever you want, Lord. Whatever trial I've got to go through, whatever it's got, I've got to go through to make me stronger, but don't take your Holy Spirit from me. David had a passion for the things of God. When he became the king, the first order of his administration was to go get the ark of the covenant. More than anything in this world, I've got to have Jesus. More than anything in this world, more than wealth, more than anything. Somebody needs to cry today. More than anything, I need you, Jesus. <laughs> David started out with a mess. David went and got the Ark of the Covenant and he put it back on the cart. Amen. The problem is, is that it was mishandled. And if it's not in God's order, God won't honor it. Everything about God is done in decency and in order. There are things that we must understand. We're uh, able to do whatever we're big enough to do. But in God's economy, in God's kingdom, there is an order for everything that is done. A lot of people that are pursuing God are doing and thinking their own thing and thinking that God will compromise because they think it's all right. This house will never pursue convenience or compromise. This will never be a compromising place. It will never become a carnal, watered-down holiday show or just a place of inspiration. But we've got to have the Word of God. We've got to have the power of God. We've got to have the presence of God. I want to see the miracles of God. I want to see people that are delivered, set free. At the end of the day, the glory never be written in a card. It'll be carried on the backs of consecrated men and women of God. Or oh, if you only knew your significance, if you only knew because we get caught up in our own world and our own trials and our own bills and our own frustrations and the things that we fight every day, but on top of all of that, can I help you see the big picture? You're a child of God. You're a divine influence. You have authority. You have power. You're a part of this great network of the kingdom of God, the family of God. They put the Ark of the Covenant on a card. Hit a bump, the ark bounces off. Yuza, who had lived with the ark for years, put his hands on the ark to keep it from falling. It seemed to be the right thing. It seemed to be the right reaction. But no matter what it seems to be, we've got to make sure that it lines up with the Word of God. It may seem right. It may seem like we were doing the right thing. But that doesn't matter. What does matter is what thus saith the word of the Lord. The Bible says when Yusa touched that ark, he died. Why did he die? Amen. He put his hand to the ark. It seemed like the right thing to keep it from falling. He died trying to pop up what God ultimately was trying to get rid of. There's a lot of people in the kingdom that try to prop up methods that God is saying, I want you to get rid of. It's not the latest and greatest program. It is the latest and greatest power of God that will transform men. The thing that God wants, we've got to have order, and we're doing our best to do excellence in everything we do. But in all that we do, it's not just our thing. It's his thing. Amen. David, let the ark, amen, get put on a cart. And a man lost his life. You know the story. And they parked the ark at Obadiah's house. Amen. He wasn't in line even for the glory of God. But when they couldn't find anybody who was courageous enough to host the ark, 
while they went out and argued about and Obadiah said, while you argue about what you need to do, bring that ark of the covenant and put it at my house. And while they argued about it, amen, amen, this church is about seeking God in this season. We're not arguing about what God is up to. We're just saying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, in me, in our church, in this world. We're not going to argue about whose house is doing what and who's doing something else. What we are is getting our own house ready, getting our own house clean, and saying, come to my house, Jesus. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to tell Jesus today, if you're looking for a place to park, you can park in my house. You can come to my driveway. You can sit with me. You can sup with me because I want to be in your presence. About this time, somebody in the building that hasn't clapped yet, that hasn't raised your hand yet, ought to be patting your foot and clapping your hands and say, preach it, pastor. I know I'm carnal. I know I'm backslid, but I need to hear the word of God today, pastor. I want the blessings of God on my children. I want the blessings of God on my grandchildren, my son-in-laws, my daughter-in-law. I want the blessings of God on my church family. Oh, you haven't lived until you've lived under his banner of blessings. You haven't walked and talked unless you have felt the favor of God, the protection of God on your home until you speak the name of Jesus and you know, you know he's there. While preachers, pulpits are trying to be politically correct, trying to be entertainers, afraid to talk about the commandments, afraid to talk about same-sex marriages, afraid to talk about the biblical principles of Christian living. Amen. Men are trying to be women, and women trying to be men, and all this messed up mess that comes straight from the gates of hell. If the church doesn't make a de declaration, if the church doesn't declare what is right and what is godly, we will have variables and everybody will be watered down and lose what God has given us as an instruction. Sure, there's a form of godliness. Sure that God shows up where people worship him. That doesn't give them a birth certificate. That doesn't give them the right to enter heaven. There's a lot of things that are happening. Amen. But Jesus, bring goodness and mercy to my house. I need your mercy. Would you come to my house? I need you every day. Amen. Every morning, all day long, and every night. Do you feel that way today? Does anybody get the witness today that God is here? Does anybody say, I want you to park at my house. My son needs deliverance. My family needs healing. My aunt needs this. There's something that needs to happen. <laughs> David goes to the house of Ob Obadiah. And when he finds out how to appropriately carry the ark, he goes to open o Obadiah's house and when the presence of God gets in your house, your house will get fruitful. When the presence of God comes, things will happen that you never thought would happen. Things that you didn't even know were broken, he's fixing. Things that you didn't know was coming down the road. Later on, you see that he intervened. You was petitioning God for this, but God said that'll bring destruction. So he blocked that, but you find yourself down the road with blessings and the favor of God. When you find that favor, when he comes to your house, barren wounds will open. The church will begin to birth souls in the kingdom of God. There is something happening where the Spirit of God is. He attracts those that are hungry and heavy and lost. Stuff that was dead comes to life. David heard that the blessings of God was on Obadiah's life. Amen. Amen. I want the presence of God on my life. Amen. He said, I can't build a kingdom, David. I can't build a kingdom without it. 
So it goes down to Obadiah's house and, and the Ark of the Covenant. And they, they put it on the shoulders of the priest. And they start carrying it back to Jerusalem. And David saw the Ark of the Covenant on the shoulders of the priest heading to Jerusalem. And the city of God. And he picked up a, a pen and he wrote these words. Psalms 24 and 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell in. And for he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitful, he shall receive the blessing of the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Selah. Or think about that. Lift up your gates and be you lift up. You everlasting doors, don't miss this. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and, and be you lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Amen. The Lord mighty in battle. Clap your hands unto him. This is significant. Verse 9, lift up your heads, O you gates, even lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King, the King of glory. David was a king. A king is supposed to wear a robe. But why did David take off that robe and he danced with the ephod on? Because this king understood that a greater king was coming with him and a greater king shows up. You don't keep your robe on. You don't try to impress of how glorious you are and how powerful you are. He recognized that there was one greater than he that stepped into the room. Amen. I know you're beautiful. I know you're handsome. I know you've got on a great suit and a beautiful dress. I know all of the things that we have, but oh, in his presence, none of that matters. Matters. There's a king that came into this place today that deserves your worship. If you were at a ball game, if it's your favorite team, or whatever it is that you're all into, you're all into it. You're into it. You're jumping up. You're hollering. You put on the right attire. You display whatever team it is you're for. You wear that cap. You think about it night and day. You keep track of their score. But I want to tell you, there's another score. There's another name written down in glory. There was another one baptized in Jesus' name. Our house was filled. Our house was filled. Amen. Our home group is overflowing. This king deserves your worship. Doesn't deserve a little half-hearted, cute smile. He deserves everything you can give him, everything that you've got. Second Samuel 24, 24, David. David said, neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which costs me nothing. He said, I'm not going to give him some feeble something. I'm not going to give him the crumbs from the table. I'm going to give him my best. I'll out dance every one of you. I'm not intimidated. My rank, my job, my position's not changing who I am. I'm going to tell you who I am. I'm a child of God, and he has done so much for me. I'm in the presence of God. I'm going to worship with everything I've got. <laughs> Pastor, I'm going to mess up my hair. I've got perfume on. I, if I do, oh, you ought to shout that hair down every now and then. You ought to get sweaty sometimes. He deserves some sweat. He deserves you going home exhausted. He deserve, deserves everything you've got. David said, I can't offer him something that doesn't cost me something. He deserves some high praise. He deserves some shouting. He deserves some dancing. He deserves some hallelujahs. Oh, I wish you'd do that right now. I didn't come to worship you. I come to worship him. 
The fastest growing, the greatest harvesters of truth, greatest churches where souls are being born into the family of God is like many of you. They're worshiping churches. You almost have to shut them down like we do you sometimes because the presence of God is there. Why? Because God inhabits the praise of his people. Well, somebody help me praise him right now. <laughs> David is carrying the Ark of the Covenant into the city of Jerusalem. He's leading that procession of praise, and he writes Psalms, Psalms 24, 7. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and lift up your everlasting doors, for the King of glory will come in. Many theologians believe that when David said, lift up your head, O you gates, David was talking about the gates of the city and the doors of the city of Jerusalem. In David's time, a people would build a monument or a building unto their God. And when they would build a city unto their God, they would always build it in the, that city gates. And the bigger the gates of that city were, the bigger the God was that they served and the more power that they seemed to, to have. Amen. And so <clears throat> the, the bigger the gate on the outside, it announced the size of their God. So if you walked up to a city and there was a small gate, you knew that was not a very powerful God that reigned in that city. <clears throat> and they looked up and they saw this small gate. They would say, oh, we can take that gate because they're not very powerful. Amen. And how do we know this is a weak people? We see what they have erected is very small, a small gate, a small door, a small God. And when David is coming to the seat of Jerusalem, David said, here, lift up your head, O you gates, be lifted up, because the king of glory is coming. In other words, David said, I'm watching them. They're carrying this king of glory. They're carrying the glory of the Lord. He's getting ready to come into Jerusalem. But I'm looking at this gate, and it lets us into this city. I'm looking at this God, and we're carrying him in the form of the Ark of the Covenant. And I've got to tell the city that the God of the universe is coming, but the gates that they have is not big enough to hold my God. My God is bigger than all the gates they have. He's bigger than anything this world has seen. He's bigger, he's greater, he's more powerful. He can't fit through the door that some of y'all have built for him. He can't be enclosed in the little box that some people have put him in. Lift up your gates, amen. The gate of little thinking does not please God. We've got to get him through the gate beyond that lukewarm experience, beyond that religious tradition that has been built. He can't fit through that. He can't fit through the gate of carnality. But when you open up your arms and open up your heart and open up your mind and open up your spirit and say, thy kingdom is what I want, Lord, more than anything else. Tear down these false gods. Tear down the stuff that I put in place of you. Don't be surprised when you see the gates opening. Uh, some people will be running toward you, and some people might be running from you. Amen. Amen. He doesn't fit under some people's threshold. Psalm 27, lift up your heads, O you gates. Amen. This is not a little God doing little things. I see a big God doing bigger things. I expect to see in the years, my years on this earth, the greatest thing that has ever happened. I believe it in the next years. I'm going to see more that happened than all the years prior because we are in his timing. As the music comes, what David was really saying is take the lid off, church. Take the lid off. Think bigger because God is greater and bigger. Amen. He doesn't fit into that just religious little part-time basis, but he wants to be God of everything. Amen. Matthew 21, this king of glory who came in the type and symbol in the Old Testament. He, man, comes in on the back of an unridden colt. 
The Ark of the Covenant is a type and symbol of Jesus. The Ark of the Covenant was made out of Shedham wood, covered in gold. Wood here, no doubt, represents humanity. Gold, no doubt, represented deity. He was flesh wrapped in divinity. Amen. Wood covered in gold. And when he came into the city, amen, Matthew 21, he didn't come in a military entourage. He didn't come in pomp and glory. He didn't come to impress the man, the people outwardly. He didn't come riding on a white stallion. How awesome it is that Jesus comes riding on the back of a donkey. Amen. Do you know why he rode on a donkey? Because he came not to demonstrate fleshly power, amen, but his spiritual power came riding in humility. Would you stand? You can't walk into the city with arrogance and pride. It is not by might nor power, but it's by his spirit. Amen. By his spirit. Jesus told us something here about the way of humility. When he walks into the city, the Bible says the whole city, don't miss this, the whole city was moved, moved. Sometimes God shakes things in the heavenlies. Unless you're spiritually tuned, what happens in the heavenlies, it always happens in the heavenlies before it happens on planet Earth. A shaking that is happening because God is going to have the final say. And this world is enveloped and Satan has multiplied his power on earth that people have surrendered their will to him. But there's a war in the heavenlies and a shaking in the heavenlies before there's a shaking on earth. Now, I believe that God is strategically placing his angels in place to do the work that has never been done before. And he is enduing us with power from the high. In Hebrews, he said, he will shake the earth. Sometimes he shakes the heavenlies first. Unless you're really tuned into the spirit, you will think it's just another day. But those that walk in the spirit will hear the voice of God. Ear to the ground, I sense something dynamic is in the works. God's greatest work is yet to be seen. Amen. Can you feel him when he walks in the room? I remember a man, big man with a little voice, little man with a big voice it was. How Kennedy. W. PFA, Pensacola, radio station. I think that's what it's called. Science. But he'd had an experience with God. But fame got him. He left, hit the road, traveling, singing, traveling, singing, year to year to year to year. In a motel room, the darkness overwhelmed him. The memory of God used to be with me. I was happy. But I began to chase what I thought would fulfill me. He said, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just find me a little church. He was on the road singing. Went into the church small church to the altar cried out wept prayed couldn't find him felt like he'd gone too far he had taken for granted taken for granted ultimately at some point God granted him mercy brought him back in the family of God but he told what it was like to not be able to feel God's presence. He told what it was like to be out of the grace of God. 
and to know where he used to be and where he was. I'm preaching to somebody now. The door is open. And no man can come to God unless he draws them. I believe he's drawing you today into the deep things of God. Somebody needs to repent today. Somebody needs to commit their life today. Somebody needs to be baptized in the wonderful name of the Lord today. Somebody needs to be filled with his spirit. I open this altar. Come. If you're discouraged, come. If you need a miracle in your body, come. If you need healing, deliverance, come. Amen. 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 When Jesus walks into the room,